From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deck, and most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. We've got to give a big shout out to a good friend of ours, super producer, the heartbreaker of Knoxville, Dylan Fagan, for coming (laughs) through in the clutch. Uh, All three of us went through some Shyamalans, uh, to get to this recording today, uh, company started by Cults Part Two. You know, a while back, guys, we did we explored Falun Gong because I think we all wanted to go to the Shenyun Festival for a while. Sure. I certainly did. <laughs> it's apparently a delightful show. <laughs> it is. It is a delightful show. I hear. Uh, and when we were doing that, it sort of triggered this other exploration about conspiracies in company origin stories. We talked a lot about companies that appear to have been started or at the very least heavily influenced by, associated with what we would call cults. And we knew we would find a few, but I think we're all surprised by just how many very successful businesses, and weirdly enough, a ton of restaurants, are in fact run by you know new religious movements the PC term, uh, and we knew there would have to be uh, a second chapter to this, as we'll see at the end of this evening's episode. There may need to be a third chapter. Anyway, here are the facts. We're not going to waste too much time on the setup. Uh, check out part one, because we've got a lot of crazy stuff to get to. But, you know, you never know who really owns something, right? Unless you dig into it. Can you own a song? Can you own the wind? Can you paint uh, with all the colors of the wind? It's possible if you want to ask Disney. They own a lot of stuff, uh, as mm-hmm. it turns out. But in a lot of situations, it is, uh, to your point, Ben, difficult to trace exactly where uh, an organization begins, perhaps, you know, who the parent company truly is. And it is true that a lot of companies are owned by some pretty bizarre groups, entities, organizations. Uh, the most immediate examples of this that we can think of are in the world of corporations where single massive entities own um, an entire sector, you know, of of the uh, economy, perhaps. Great example, Luxottica Brands. Shout out. Um, for all intents and purposes, a monopoly on overpriced sunglasses. Uh, I'm a big jerk and own several pairs because they also somehow make you feel like you got to own them or else you're not really wearing. Are you really wearing sunglasses if they're not Ray-Ban or something that Luxottica owns? I think they even own Sunglass Hut. It's like they own the means of production and the means of distribution. Yes. Weird. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there are so many huge brands like that, that that if you look at the branching brands that you think of or buy on a regular basis, you'd be astounded. I mean, that's everything from Mars and Coca-Cola, Nestle, what, Kellogg's, Mm -hmm. General Mills, PepsiCo. Unilever or Unilever owns everything. Yeah. uh, Even Dannon. Mm -hmm. Remember the yogurt brand, Mm -hmm. Dannon? Mm -hmm. There's like that's hundreds of things underneath there. And then you have like Procter & Gamble, for example. You know, they're like a giant chemical company, essentially, that owns all of these brands that are essentially fancy packaging of chemicals that you put in your body or on your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And any if if you look at almost any um, food product, right, genre of food product, then what you'll see is there is a remarkably small number of players who are actually in the game. And that's because this is very good business for them, right? You, Why would you want to own one team in the sport when you could own the sport itself, right? Then you make money no matter who loses. So we we looked at this and we see this reflected or related to some of the other stuff we explore with companies. In part one of this series, we looked at companies that, honestly, I I think we all assumed were somewhat innocuous. Celestial Seasonings, Sleepy Time Tea, uh, (laughs) Celis Academy, Onita Silverware, I think we all knew about going in. Uh, Some of us have personal experience with the Yellow Deli. Narcanon is run by Scientology. The list, or Narcanon is... Scientology adjacent. (laughs) According to everyone except for Scientology, including the U.S. government, Narcanon is run by Scientology. 
I mean, speaking of innocuous, I mean, the sleepy time tea, you got that lazy little bear. What could go? What could be wrong? He looks so lovely. You know, the celestial seasonings, all their branding, these companies and their their forward facing, you know, imagery and branding are designed to make you not question it. Right. Yeah, man. And while the particulars of each story may vary from case to case, you know, like Washington Times and the Moonies uh, versus Narconon and Scientology and so on, they all have this one commonality. They internally share some sort of unifying ideological or spiritual association. In some cases, these associations are hidden from the average consumer. And in some other cases, they are openly presented to the consumer in the interest of proselytization. You know, we can maybe gather some new recruits. When you walk in to get a sandwich from Chick-fil-A, this might be your road to Damascus moment, you know? Yeah, I mean, even like In-N-Out Burger and Cookout, for example, as two like kind of, you know, regional burger chains, they have scripture printed kind of in fine print on some of their uh, cups and, and, you know, paper kind of wares. Well, and then others, like one we're going to talk about today. I Guys, I happened to go to a store that sold some vegan food, and I was excited <laughs> about eating that vegan food. Mm-hmm. And I walked in, made my order, then kind of looked around near the front and just saw, huh, those are those are different magazines than I've ever seen. Did they, <laughs> did they have the TV channel? Uh, I did not see a TV channel on in the place we're going to talk about. We're going to play a clip of it. Yeah. And then we've got other, and look, it's weird that there are a lot of restaurants doing this, but also to be very clear, a lot of restaurants that just reflect the, um, the owner's spiritual beliefs, that doesn't make them sinister at no. all. You know, I, I live up the street from a place called soul vegetarian. I go there pretty frequently because their food slaps. You guys, I went to this pumpkin patch the other day called Burt's Pumpkin Farm or whatever the heck it's called in North Georgia. Uh, And I went on my first hayride. And through a certain point on this hayride, you pass these like creepy animatronic pumpkins that like give you a little lesson in, uh, in, in, in the Lord. Uh, oh, yeah. Like tribulation Very trail. subversively. <laughs> or rather, you know, um, in a subdued kind of comedic fashion. But you're almost like double take. Like, wait a minute. That, I, they're trying to indoctrinate me a little bit. Or at the very least, slip that message on in. I love that mention, Ben. The the hell houses are strong right now. Oh, oh man. Those? We should go. We, I, loved, I loved those. That little slice of uh, suburbia. You know. Um, maybe we can go to one. Yeah. See, well, let's find one with a really big, weird budget. You know, like the guys who get the car just to burn it? There was one in my hometown where they had like a wrecked car outside of the church. like as, And it was like featured in it where I guess somebody drunk drove and, you know, killed all their friends. <laughs> and then the devil came and took them. Right. Yeah. And then, oh, man. The only thing is at the end, they make you stop and listen to the, you know, the moral of the story. Oh, yeah. Right. So we always snuck off in the woods and did mischievous things mischievous things but the um the point of this that we're making is this is a very common thing and when you look at the idea of companies quote unquote owned by cults what we have to realize is that a cultic organization never calls itself a cult uh like for instance uh delta which is a huge airline here in the u.s well it's global airline but it's based in atlanta delta jokes about being called a cult because they have a very strong internal corporate culture, but they're not isolating people from their friends and family. They're not forcing people to buy stuff, you know, uh, or give away all their worldly possessions. That's the big one. Can can I just double back real quick and and make sure it's clear that I was not implying that Christianity is a cult per se. Um, I was just saying that there are ways that are analogous to the ways that these kind of messages can be slipped in through innocuous means like a pumpkin ride or, you know, a a haunted house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or veggie tales or whatever it's called, like the, uh, or, or, you know, Narnia. (laughs) <laughs> right. Uh, that, that whole book series. I, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And all, none of us are calling these things a cult. There are offshoots. There will always be sects that are considered heretical by the mainstream of a particular religion. Uh, but when we're talking about cults, we're really talking about tactics. And that's why some of these things 
some of these entities will say, no, we're absolutely not a cult. We don't tell you what to believe, right? Yeah, we just listen to the Supreme Master and all that she says at all and, times. And do whatever they say. And, you know, we buy her uh, sacred bathwater. True story. Uh, so <laughs> what we're telling is this. It's alarmingly common for these products and entities to have their true ownership kind of play to the left. Uh, and a lot of these companies are everywhere in the West. You will run across them or you can run across them in any major city. And we still wonder how many cases are out there, how many companies are run by cults. Here's where it gets crazy. Well, it turns out there are a lot of cases out there. There are a ton, not a literal ton, a figurative ton, much bigger than a real literal ton. Hell, enough to warrant a part two and a potential part three, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, each of these companies, just to be completely fair, we're going to give you some of the accusations against them or criticisms, and then we're going to give you their side as well. And uh, we can't wait to hear if you have firsthand experience, but please be aware they may not be outright owned by a cult or a religious sect, new religious movement, if you prefer, but they're associated with these groups through either their founders or their current key influencers. And also, we, we know the C word can be a hot button issue, especially to folks that participate in some of this stuff. I think I've mentioned my experience with the Baha'i faith in the past, where I had some friends that were a member of that, and there are certain folks who study this stuff who would classify that group as a cult. I found them to be very nice people and <laughs> Till after the fact, didn't really realize how kind of culty it was. But, you know, they are there are lovely people that participate in some of these things and they're, they're not all inherently insidious. Right. Mm -hmm. And a cult, you know, cults have it's got a bad connotation these days. But really, there are two main definitions. A cult is a group that uh, or a system that venerates or adores a particular figure or an object. Right. And then a the cult in the bad sense is a relatively small group of people who have insular beliefs and practices that the rest of the world thinks are kind of off. But in neither case is it necessarily bad. It's not like equated to being terrorist or something. Well, and it's also interesting how sometimes the size of the organization and the adherence, you know, in terms of, you know, the general population can dictate whether something is considered a cult because no one would ever say that Christianity or Catholicism are a cult, but they certainly worship one person and there's a lot of cultic type things and knowledge and secrets that go along with it. But because it's so highly adopted, no one would ever call it that. I mean, some people might, you know, know, backhandedly. But um, I think a big hallmark of a lot of these things is that they're niche and kind of smaller and maybe off the radar. If there was one person, if there was just like one guy who practiced Buddhism, people would say he is weird. He's very chill. He's very cool, but he's, he's weird. And because there are millions of Buddhists in the world, it is not treated as something eccentric. So you're right. There's a there's a measure of scope and size that affects the way the world regards these systems. Let's cut to Amway. <laughs> Here we go. I was thinking about this. We did an episode on MLMs, right? Multi-level marketing. We had, oh, we had yeah. to. Have. Yeah. Yeah. And didn't we talk about Amway in that a little bit? Just like the origins of it we, without We would have had to, for we, sure. Yeah, because it's the, it's the biggest in the game. Uh, and... The critics of Amway call it the worst of all multi-level marketing uh, organizations. It's a form of direct selling where the idea is that everybody who works for the thing is not really an employee. You are kind of like a contractor. You don't get a salary. You don't get a wage. And uh, when MLMs go bad, when direct selling goes wrong – what happens is the emphasis becomes not on selling these products, but on recruiting people to sell stuff for you. Uh, and that is where, that's where you get into all the tricky stuff of like distributors and downline and upline. And that nomenclature can sound, you know, kind of culty. Well, it's, it's definitely uh, proprietary to that thing, right? Not necessarily that specific MLM, but to MLMs in particular, right? This it's using terminology that makes it when you've got somebody else who's also a part of that group is super insular. Yeah, yeah, like reading um, internal conversations between people in Scientology, right? Oh. Or or internal conversations, honestly, in branches of government. Lots of acronyms. 
the afternoons or, get this or our emails sometimes, oh, man. You know, I was going to say, yeah, like the radio slash podcast business, right? All the, all the terminology, other people would just be like, what are you talking about? I, oh yeah. I almost apologize to you guys. Cause we were, we were running pretty quickly, uh, for the past few weeks. And I, I realized I had shot off some email where it was like, if you, or a message, I can't remember what it was, but it was like uh, one or two lines. And if you read it, it would sound like a weird code or a bunch of typos. Like, hey, are we okay with EOD on STWYTK <laughs> native ad, ad recopy? It's a 60 second. Did, yeah. just, yeah. <laughs> did, we, did we change that CTA or is it A-OK? Oh, sorry. <laughs> there Hello. we go. <laughs> Drop the beat. So, uh, yeah, so you're right. That's a very important point. This is a common thing. Uh, Amway, quick background, Amway is short for American Way Association, founded in 1959 by two grade school friends, Jay Van Andel and Richard DeVos. And just like Google and Alphabet, Amway eventually created a parent company called Altacore to run all of its stuff. You know, and I wasn't sure, but I did just do a little Googling myself and confirm that uh, Richard DeVos is the father of Richard Marvin DeVos Jr., who is the husband of Betsy DeVos, who was the kind of weird secretary of education under Trump who seemed to have no real experience and did some kind of wacky stuff. Uh, um, like so this, trying this, to destroy the American education system. Yeah, more or less. You said it. Um, but this is a line, you know, this is like essentially what you might call Ben, like American royalty, you know, in terms of its control over business and policy. Right. Cause you can't just shove a, 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 a you know, non-experienced person into a role like that, a post like that, without having some serious pull. Yeah, dude. And this company, this corporation does have a lot of pull. Uh, its sales topped $8.9 billion in 2019 alone, like the what? total for Altico. Yeah, right? And they, this, they sell health and was beauty a charity. home products. Isn't yeah. it tied to charity, though, in some way? Or is it like the American Way Association? I mean, isn't that meant to, like, help people yeah if you go to their website you'll see a lot of stuff about like the american spirit and working hard uh, <laughs> yeah kind of, kind of like the, the hoover dam video <laughs> exactly it's yeah. a little it's a little hooverish um they maybe, do have maybe i just assumed that because of the name the american way association and amway and all of that it just sounds to me like the proceeds would go to uh, helping you know refugees or something but that is not the case <laughs> Yeah, if the refugee is like a top 1% distributor for Amway, then yeah, they'll get a lot of money. It's it's weird. So, yes, they, they do have grants, and I'm sure they have a lot of charitable activity. They have been investigated multiple times in multiple countries by a panoply of organizations. They have never been found guilty of running an alleged pyramid scheme, which oh. is, uh, what, you know, which is what people say about MLMs. Then why are we talking about them? But they're not an MLM pyramid scheme. They're an MLM, just a regular one. They're direct sales, right? They're empowering a, you. They're an RLM, regular level marketing. Yeah, scheme. There we go. the scheme is implied. I, I, th I think those controlling these types of things would take issue with using the word scheme. By the way, but Ben, you said they've never been found guilty. Does, no. Does no, that they mean they've been found not guilty? Uh, they have been found guilty of some things, but not specifically being a pyramid scheme. Uh, and they have paid tens of millions of dollars repeatedly in out of court settlements to oh. wash something. So, uh, accused, but never convicted, uh, in 1979, the federal trade commission here in the States said, okay, Amway, you're not a pyramid scheme, but you are very guilty of exaggerating income claims and you're also clearly fixing prices on products so here's what we're gonna do of course no one gets in trouble because you're a corporation but we want you to stop airing misleading commercials and advertisements and things like that because you're making people who may be in desperate um in desperate times you're making them believe that they can instantly become millionaires when the truth is that the majority of people in your organization end up losing money over time. 
And Doesn't this kind of smack of prosperity theology a it little bit? It is very much prosperity theology. Okay. Yes, it, you nailed but it. it. But it's like really masquerading as something else because it doesn't come off as inherently religious like the 700 Club or whatever. Or like, you know, a lot of these folks that have these infomercials selling buckets of, you know, doomsday prep goods. But still, if you dig deep enough, which is our whole point here, I think, you know, from the intro, you'll find that it very much employs – sort of, I don't know, like Jesus cult kind of tactics, I guess, right? Oh, yeah. It's going to get really weird in a second. So, okay, if you're a typical member of Amway, they will call you an IBO, independent business owner, right? Because you will have the power. We are empowering you. Uh, there's a book called Amway, The Cult of Free Enterprise, which you can read online for free. Uh, it looks a little bit hokey, I'm going to be honest, but it was a different time. And the author, Stephen Butterfield, has a lot of information about how, in his perspective, Amway as an organization, these different groups of distributors, they use cult-like tactics to attract members and retain control over them. So there's intense parent. You can click by all like the classic slow jazz of how to make a working cult. There's paranoia toward anyone critical of the organization, internal or external. Matt, you pointed out the um, the specificity of jargon and nomenclature to make it increasingly its own language. Uh, the To your point, Noel, a lot of the meetings and seminars, apparently, per this guy and other critics, they look more like religious revival meetings. And then even though most people appear to lose money, this idea of the, this aspirational idea is enough to keep them leveraged and going into the organization. Like you'll read stories where they have to sell a certain number of things per month and to not be a pyramid scheme, uh, they can't just buy their own stuff. They have to sell it to like some percentage of it has to be sold to an actual customer who's not them. And they get so desperate that they will, this is true. They will order stuff to like a neighbor's address to make it look like that neighbor bought it. And then they'll just sneak over and take it before, you know, the Joneses find out. Are, are they worried about like getting, you know, being on the hook for a product or is it literally just about the, being terrified of losing their membership in this, what they consider prestigious organization that they feel very strongly about? I, I don't know, but I, I would just say in going to the website right now, to amway.com you can shop there on the website for products and those appear to be direct sell products like it uh, at least on this from this end it looks like you are buying products from amway and i'm assuming as one of, what did you call them ben ibos mm -hmm. i'm assuming as one of those individuals and operating your individual business you would then resell the product you purchase. Is that correct? You know, I, I'm not sure how the system works. I understand you would get wholesale products and they've gone through a couple of different iterations. They had something that, um, Kickster or Quickster or something that came out, uh, to focus entirely on online sales instead of in-person sales, but it's, it's the same thing. So there have been some evolutions or different iterations. It is interesting, too, because they have all these, like, exclusive brands, you know, like Nutralite for, you know, plant-based supplements, artistry for skincare and makeup, excess for energy drinks and shakes, and then, like, a home kind of cleaning products and safer and gentler for all, you know? Yeah. And you get points. You get Amperk points every time you make a purchase. It's interesting stuff, guys. Yeah, and you can find statements from a, a lot of the criticism comes from disgruntled former associates of Amway, right? Uh, and gov different government organizations. So there was one Redditor, and you can find this statement online, who alleged that at its core, Amway is in their mind, a prosperity Jesus cult. When they say once you're in the, the patina of fake professionalism sort of goes away and you're, you're taught uh, a kind of, non-denominational spirituality, sort of a, like a, what was that uh, thing Oprah Winfrey really loved, like manifesting the secret. You're taught kind yeah, of yeah. the secret. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like words and thoughts have power. You can speak your dreams into existence. If you quote, have enough faith, if you don't succeed 
if something doesn't work out up to and including like a non unpredictable medical condition, then it's kind of on you because you didn't have enough faith. You spoke negative things into existence. And then there's one thing that really stood out. This person says, I remember stories where they would literally tell doctors to keep their mouth shut if the doctor found a terminal illness and not say anything. I think they would still take medicine and so on, but they would literally tell the doctor not to speak the words as if the doctor's words had magical powers that could cause the illness to take a foothold. So that's crazy. That's just scratching the surface. That's just one example. There are more examples of companies that are alleged to have these controversial tactics at the core of their being. Uh, we're going to pause, take a word from our sponsor, who knows who it will be, uh, and then we'll be back with a... We'll be back with another example that's um, a little more true crime, actually. And we're back. Uh, moving on to uh, company number two of today's episode, True Value out of Utah. Uh, what does Utah make you think of? Hmm. Snow caps? <laughs> yes. No. Salt the, the candy or the, or the mountains? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. Uh, salt flats. No caps. Salt flats. That should be a, a, a rap song. I don't know what comes next. Something about cooking something up in the something vat. Yeah. Um, no cap. Yeah, there you go. The Kingston clan. Tell us about the Kingston clan. Oh, I'm sorry. Boy. Utah to me makes me think of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big one. Right. Um, so the to our earlier conversation about sex and breakaway groups, the Kingston clan is a insular secretive breakaway group uh, from the Church of Latter-day Saints. And internally, it's called the Order with a capital O. They have several doctrinal disagreements with the mainstream LDS church. Uh, they're very tight-knit. They are a polygamous community. They have been practicing for decades and decades arranged marriages, often between underage girls and sometimes much older men, and not infrequently. These folks are related to each other. Uh, I don't know to what degree it's more like a cousin thing than I think a, a sibling thing. And there are, again, not to beat a dead horse here, but there are lots of good, lovely, law-abiding folks that practice this faith and do not do any of those things. And in fact, look at those behaviors as a black mark on their faith. You know, if you've ever seen the show Big Love um, on HBO, there's it kind of shows those two sides. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting world. So, I mean, I'm sure we have listeners that maybe grew up in the in the church and, and have thoughts about this. I just want to make sure we're being real clear that this is not everybody that's involved with LDS. A hundred percent. Is it called True Value? True Value is one of the stores they own. And you would never know this because the Kingston clan owns a ton of different businesses. True value is like a franchise hardware store thing. They're at, they're based up North. They don't, uh, the Kingston clan doesn't own the entirety of true value, but that, that was sort of how I began to find out about them. They also own, Oh, we'll get to what they own in a second. Let's talk more about their fundamentalist beliefs. Gotcha. I'm uh, sorry. Just, I was really confused because, in my head, I saw a bunch of products called True Value, but it was actually just the Walmart brand Great Value, I think, oh. <laughs> products. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, sorry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Well, I mean, are the Waltons at this level? Are they engaging in cult-like activity? <laughs> Unclear. You can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> I Walmart, don't think so. Walmart can move in and just break a town. It's we've seen we, Everybody in the United States has seen that happen or knows about it. So anyway, if you look at members of the Kingston clan, you'll see that they don't appear anachronistic. They don't really stick out. Uh, they wear modern clothing. Female members of the order are encouraged to get new last names for themselves and their progeny to downplay that existence of plural marriage, which is just another word for polygamy. Uh, and wives in the order are also expected to work and pay their own bills. So it sounds a little bit feminist in that regard. But then you learn that this group, the Kingston clan, preaches women are the property of their husbands and fathers. You got to follow the dude's order in every area of your life, including when you get married, whom you marry, when you get pregnant, whether or not you can go to school. And these are, you know, typical and, and very dangerous fundamental beliefs. 
this is a lot of the stuff that's depicted in, in Big Love uh, in terms of the compounds kind of out in the, you know, the farther reaches of, of the country, I guess, parts of, of Utah, not within the cities where they kind of have a law unto themselves. And um, there's a prophet in the show named Roman who's sort of like this, the head of this. And it is they don't they go out of their you know, they, they don't make any bones about it. It's depicted as, as a cult and him as a cult leader. Mm -hmm. And with all that stuff, which is important, which can be heartbreaking and, of course, dangerous, sometimes fatal, with all that stuff put to one side, there's another thing that the Kingston clan does. Uh, they're very, very, or they were very, very good at business, and they have a unique banking arrangement or system within the community. Maybe we talk a little bit about the Kingston Bank. It's weird. I don't know how you could ever convince me to do this. I don't know that you could. Maybe. Uh, but each member, when you, when you are working, you have an income, your money doesn't go into Bank of America or Wells Fargo or one of these places. Your money goes into the organization's bank. The organization's bank that is controlled by what? The high few in charge? <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah. when you say the organization's bank, we're not saying the uh, giant bank that they bank with. We're saying a bank <laughs> founded and operated by the organization, right? The Kingston Bank, yeah. You have to give all your money to the bank if you're in the community. And if you want to withdraw money, then you have to go to the bank and imagine walking up to the teller at whatever you know your bank may be or your credit union and saying, Hi, I, I'd like to withdraw, you know, five hundred dollars, and then having the teller just sort of cross their arms and go, "All right, why? <laughs> what are you going to do?" <laughs> or basically asking you for a pitch document. Well, what, what's your pitch? Why? Why? Why do you want that money? What are you going to use it for? Exactly. And if it's consensual and it's above board, that arrangement is totally legal. You know, the problem is what's consent. It's like when Britney Spears was under that protectorship or conservatorship or whatever and had to, like, justify any expense that she, you know, wanted to go to Starbucks or take the kids out or something. She had to, like, explain it. Well, I, th I think about, like, a co-op or a, a trust of some sort where we've got several of those in, in Atlanta, like land trusts, land co-ops co and those kinds of things where everybody puts in, Right. Those are and largely then, good, though, right? They yeah. give first-time homeowners the ability to buy a house, and there's positive things about them. But I see what you're saying. And then if you've got ideas to use some of those funds, you get together and you pitch an idea of why you're going to use it. To me, I don't know. May maybe it is the same as that. Maybe it just feels different to me. Because we're on the outside, you know, I mean, th th I guess the question becomes one of consent. Like, are these people coerced into participating in this system or do they think that they they that the leaders have their best interest at heart and they're happy to participate in this system? And also the question of boundaries. So I know a lot of people in co-ops, right, their their relationship with the co-op is quite uh, is quite well defined. You know, uh, you're. The difference I would posit here, Matt, is that in most co-ops, the kind that we're thinking about, you know, like the hippie grocery store or whatever, shout out to Seven Onda in Little Five Points, uh, that's a co-op. And they're not telling people, they're not arranging marriages, right? They're not forcing child labor. They're saying, is this the best place for us to get avocados from? You That's know right. what I mean? And like sourcing they vote, things. From, they vote you know, on that. Yeah. yeah. Where they exactly where they source things from? Do they feel like they, these are uh, organizations that uphold their values? Stuff like that, right? And nobody knows how much money the Kingston Bank actually has. It's nobody, very nobody. Well, there. I'm sure like there are eight dudes who know. Well, uh, but I mean, this is not something that is. I mean, publicly available in any way, shape, or form. I did not know that. That's very interesting. How, how are they allowed to exist without reporting to the IRS and without like with this much money uh, passing uh, through there? Okay, okay. Yeah, they found out. The FBI okay, cool. found out. Yeah, it takes a uh, minute sometimes. <laughs> in 2016, the FBI raided multiple businesses owned by the Kingston Group during an investigation into allegations of tax fraud, high level tax fraud. Uh, it all orbits around this energy company that they controlled. And various reports that you could find publicly or in various public statements said, Altogether, the Kingston clan, the order, has about $150 to $170 million. 
However, if you got insiders to speak and you can find some speaking anonymously, they would say that figure is laughably low because the orders empire spans six different states. They have all sorts of seemingly unrelated businesses with, um, (laughs) with very innocuous names. And we know what's up with innocuous names, standard restaurant equipment, co fidelity funding core, uh, fountain of youth, health and athletic club, East side market. Uh, they get a coin machine distributor, digital systems, family stores, true value, uh, they also have a mine that for a while was making a million a month. They have cas- a casino and tons of farms. Uh, and then the, su- the thing that got them in trouble was the Washaki Renewable Energy Company or the WRE Group. Because what they were doing is getting grants and government money for a biofuel project or subsidy. And they were cleaning up because they didn't spend any money actually making biofuel. What are they making? They were making nine and 10 year old children show up at the office and help forge documents like bills of lading and invoicing. They're super big on child labor. I thought that was the Montessori school. The Montessori school (laughs) is the hand tasks. Yeah. Yeah. They have the little red schoolhouse Montessori. Yeah. 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 kid did Montessori for a while. It was weird, but it seemed really cool at the time. But then it was like, this is too much. So the Kingston group, has created this business empire without clear connections to them by design. They kind of want to stay out of the spotlight. They want to pursue their own belief system. And they were pretty good at it. You could walk through Salt Lake City and never know just how many things they actually own. They can be traced back to them. But that seems to be changing. Just this year in April, five Kingston-associated individuals were sentenced to prison for what Uncle Sam calls a $1 billion biofuel tax conspiracy. So they actually, some of them did actually go to jail. It's pretty rare in these types of corporate uh, cases, you know. It's usually there's a fall person or, you know, somebody further down the line that gets sent to jail, or it's just a fine that is sort of laughable. Um, So that, you know, I guess that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that... uh, it's troubling, too, because you can read statements of people who have escaped the cult or, excuse me, the order, uh, some of whom escaped because women are treated like things in the organization, some of whom were booted out uh, forcibly because of their sexual orientation. And you can, there's some great work on Vice about this. You can read, um, you can read any number of stories from an outfit called the Cult Education Institute that talks about a lot of this, uh, just gird yourself and be ready because some of it is quite disturbing stuff, especially when you get into the alleged and proven uh, sexual crimes of some of the leadership of the sect. And they're still doing business. They're still making money. Hand over fist. I I propose we go to an ad break. And uh, we were thinking about this, guys. We wanted to end on something that was not as horrible, ostensibly, as, uh, you know, a a religious sect of child abusers, which is what the Kingston clan is. We're going to go to something that has a creepy name, in my opinion, but it's, uh, according to some people, it's pretty nice. Uh, We'll pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll enter The Loving Hut. We're back. We're in the loving hut. What is that? You're it's in the, the loving hut, Matt. Tell us about it. <laughs> I think um, I went to the same one. It's yeah. a, it's honestly a purveyor of delicious vegan food. It was awesome. I really, really enjoyed it when I went there. What'd and I didn't remember? really understand any of the stuff going on around it, but you know. Look, this is my experience, guys. I walked in, look at the menu, order some food, walk outside. When I walk back in, notice the magazines, take my food, hang out with the magazines a little bit longer, and then realize, oh, there's something going on here. There's somebody they keep referring to as Supreme Master. 
<laughs> there's a there's a quote on their website from him, and it's just uh, attributed to SMCH. I'm guessing SM stands for Supreme Master, but and also the quote sounds nice. We have to be compassionate again. We have to look into our heart to live the noble way that heaven, all caps, or not all caps, first letter caps, intended us to live. Matt, Matt, I think you missed Ben's question. What was your order? That's what everyone wants to know. Oh, man. I don't know that I could tell you. It was it was probably something with soy. I'm, I'm sure soy was involved. Like it was probably tofu and soy mm-hmm. something. Cool. Yeah. We, I, I, I don't want to out us, but I think Noel and I both pulled up the menu. <laughs> no, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> We're reading it. Um, yeah. Check out the Singapore noodles, but uh, yeah. Loving hut. It's a chain of vegan restaurants all across the planet. I think for a while it's been the fastest growing vegan franchise in the world. And SM, C.H. is Supreme Master Ching Hai, a 73-year-old Vietnamese-born British businesswoman. And she's got a restaurant empire. Time magazine once called her the Buddhist Martha Stewart. Uh, she's the She created a jewelry line, a clothing line. She has something called the Quan Yin Method, or Quan Yin Method, which is, uh, that's, kind of what they're talking about in those magazines. That's kind of what the statement about compassion refers to. Uh, She might have 500,000 followers. Nobody's really sure because this is what is called a cyber sect, meaning a new religious movement that exists and spreads primarily online. And uh, unlike, oh, oh, and you can check out Supreme Master Television right now. SMTV. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like the acronym. Uh, I think Matt did say off mic to us that they did not appear to have this network uh, running 24 seven, but you might've just missed it again. Maybe they did. And I just was completely oblivious to it. And I was like, Oh, that, that seems like a nice program. <laughs> oh <laughs> I don't man. Know. I, okay. We went through again, some plot twists to record today. So we're not going to play a clip, but do look up Supreme master television. It's worth it. It's got the the captions on the bottom of the screen are in like 14 languages. They wow. are serious about going global. The little caption thing is like the bottom half of the screen. And it's all about how you should need animals, how you should have, how you should practice uh, dedication to a vegan lifestyle, which is a thing a lot of people can agree with. Sure. D- Wait. Just, yeah. It's a live stream that we can, like, I can turn it on right now. Click. And there's a- yeah, yeah, yeah. Click. You watch it. <sighs> see, right now we're, are you seeing the one about the dog with the eye condition? Yeah, but did you see the person speaking? Yeah, that's a very strange look, isn't it? <laughs> right I wasn't now, gonna we're say just anything. seeing beauty shots of <gasps> fields of trees and mountains with mist and uh, beautiful boats on, a, on the seashore. <sighs> The thing is, and we're saying this not not as a ding, because we are new to this world. The person who's the host of the like the news anchor person looks as though they are wearing a costume. Yes. And being very diplomatic. But like full body, fake beard, fake mustache, even fake hair looking thing. And uh, yeah, this is very strange. Yeah, that's that's one of the more off-putting things to me. There, I'm well, bummed cool. I haven't gotten to a shot of the anchor yet. I just see kitty cats right now. Just let <laughs> it play. There's a tiny bunny rabbit and uh, mm-hmm. daisies. Wow, it's about animal husbandry laws about it from 2018. I Ben, you weren't joking about the uh, the subtitles captions. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good language tool, right? And, and, and if you if you if you're asking yourself how could you possibly fit all of that in in one screen, is because they're popping it up like three words at a time, and yes. there's like ten different translations. They're just zooming past. Let's let's okay. read let's read some of this really quickly. Be is vegan, it, make peace, so be it. They've got other they've got other really weird weird things that they get into with this. Uh, I feel like are we seeing the same thing, guys? This is an honest, honest kid. We might not be an honest kid. Yeah, it's like a little cartoon right now. That was uh, oh, that was a so joke of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna be a little behind, but yeah. So it's it's continual. You can always check it out if you're interested. And look, you can say maybe Ching Hai seems like uh, a cult leader, but also seems less outright dangerous than some other cult leaders. The emphasis on veganism, kindness, sustainability, so on. Those are all cool aspirational things. And every loving hut 
has a lot of agency. So like if the next time we're on the road, if we go to a loving hut in California, it's going to be completely different from the loving hut in Sandy Springs, which is a suburb a little bit north of Atlanta here. And that's because the franchises, as long as they follow the rules about veganism, and as long as they uh, are down with talking about the Supreme Master, uh, they can put whatever they want on the menu. It's just like, how do you vibe? What do you feel like cooking? That's Wasn't cool. That kind of similar to the Yellow Deli. Didn't they have a, like there some of those were different? As long as they sort of like adhered to the main tenets of the whole, you know, philosophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. And that's in neither case is that typical cult stuff. Also, in the in Ching Hai's defense. She hasn't been implicated in like mass suicides or sexual abuse or kidnapping people and holding them hostage, all the other cult stuff that Netflix documentaries love. But she has been banned. Her organization has been banned in China and Vietnam, and she gets a lot of scrutiny and a lot of criticism because the idea is uh, it's very much a cult of personality. It's very centered on following her, meditating chanting your name for two and a half hours a day is recommended. Uh, you want to purify yourself by drinking uh, her spiritually imbued bath water. Uh, oh boy. Wait. wait. Yeah. 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 Like very, she takes a bath in it. I believe something like that. Yeah. It's very no. girl. Yeah. And uh, then they also tell you to do things that will help you have a better physical lifestyle. Don't eat animal flesh, avoid dairy. Don't drink booze. Don't do a lot of mind altering, well, any mind altering drugs, and then avoid something called sexual misconduct, which is kind of vague. I, I haven't seen anybody explain what that means. Like, does that mean is it an anti LGBTQ thing, or is it just like ha- only have consensual sex? This reminds me a lot of the um, United House of Prayer for All People. I think we talked about that in the past. There was a a chapter of it, I guess, in my hometown, and they have a really dope soul food restaurant. And that's kind of how they get outsiders to come, you know, pass through. But then if you look in the restaurant part, there's a giant uh, painting portrait of this guy uh, named Bishop Charles Manuel Sweet Daddy Grace. And apparently he... um, sells the water that's used to wash his feet um, to people in a similar fashion. That, that I just remember hearing that, and, and it was very uh, off, off-putting. I, I, don't, I think I decided not to go eat there anymore after that. But it was sure good, and um, forgive me if I'm getting that wrong, but that, this is a, a common thing, this idea of this is something from the leader directly. This is a substance you know, from the body of the leader that you can now own a piece of. You know, mm, and, and this... The spiritual beliefs of Ching Hai have not been without controversy by any by any means. You know, it, it, there are certain potentially harmful practices that the leader has advocated before. One of which being uh, breatharianism. We remember that one. It's the idea that if you get spiritually right and you're buttoned up, then you can cut food out of your diet. Then you can just live by breathing. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't work out for most people, just to be super clear. We're not doctors, but it doesn't work out for most people. Well, it works for a while. Anyway, well, yeah, sure. Anything works for a while. Uh, a couple just, days. <laughs> how long is that while? Yeah. And also, there's a little bit of prosperity theology because the Supreme Master tells her followers that you shouldn't be ashamed about making money. She said, specifically, people make you feel guilty about making money, dot, dot, dot. It's none of their business. And that brings us to maybe the biggest controversies, which are all financial. She donated $640,000 to the Bill Clinton Whitewater Defense Fund when he was in trouble for that thing. And they returned it because, you know, looks like you're taking cult money. They're already in a PR crisis. Well, that's a uh, lot of money for a defense fund for the for, to defend against the Whitewater scandal. She was very a very outspoken supporter of um, of former President Clinton, and also uh, when she got she got a lot of this money from some of her followers in New York, and they said she just asked for donations to quote help someone in need, and they didn't know who it was until it hit the news. And they're like, oh, the. <laughs> The guy from the White House 
And the Taiwanese authorities have also targeted uh, her businesses uh, under suspicion of illegally moving money in and out of the country in some sketchy ways. Uh, wanted, she wanted to donate to UNICEF. They turned down a $100,000 donation from her in 2001 after they investigated her organization, including Loving Hut. Uh, apparently, they've been in trouble. One of the reasons they were banned in China is because they used an electronics company as what the Chinese government is calling a front to recruit new members uh, into this religion or this movement. But on a positive note, she doesn't ask people to cut ties with her loved one, their loved ones. She doesn't ask them to hand over all their stuff. Her lectures are free. Followers are apparently allowed to leave at any time. So honestly, as cults go, not, not bad. I mean, there are accusations of, of loving hut franchises using unpaid or uh, underpaid or child labor. Um, but in comparison to the stuff we explored earlier, I don't know, man. I it just one thing we can say for sure. We're all going to a loving hut together at some point. You're invited if you're hearing this. And uh, yeah. yeah. And then bang, might, bang and menu. I mean, it really does. Mm-hmm. Look well, and it they've got free good. TV that never stops. Yes. That's the main feature. <laughs> it's, uh, we can't wait to hear what you think of that TV channel. I used to have, um, there's this series of websites or hubs I would go to where you could watch live television from around the world. And I got to tell you, it gets interesting. It's it, a good idea. It, it gets interesting, you know. But um, but we know one thing for sure. There may be a part three company of this series. Companies started by cults. Just like last time, we ran into more and more companies. We didn't get to them today. Uh, places like XJet, for instance. Uh, and, I, oh, I thought it would be, this is a cool one. Maybe we can end on an honorable mention. I was not aware. You guys might have known this before I did, but... Did you know that the the Moonies run sushi in the U.S.? They run the sushi game. The whole game? The a lot of it. Huh. Uh, can what you are we talking about? Can you elaborate? Then? <laughs> they, like, okay, so this this is a props to Daniel Frumson uh, at the New York Times. There's a great article, an actually really well designed article to read online. It's very visual graphic novelly, and the Moonies, Reverend Sun Young Moon, he. Uh, When he came to the United States, he had already made a lot of money selling various things, and he plowed tens of millions of dollars into buying boats and processing plants because he wanted his church to get into the fish distribution business. The company is called True World Foods. And if you look at the measurements now, you'll see that True World Foods foods still supplies quote most good quality american sushi restaurants with more than a million kilos of fresh fish a year and they're wait for it reeling in annual revenues of 500 billion okay <sighs> sushi. How, how, sushi. How, but how do you so, so okay so they're like up the supply chain then mm. i guess is the thing so it's not like they're directly involved with our neighborhood sushi joint but they are they control the the flow of sushi yes. wow yeah. that's crazy and this is the unification church that we're talking about right yes yeah the uh, big uh, i think one of the things they're most famous for is those huge mass marriages wow yeah yeah okay oh. And uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, True World Foods launched home delivery sushi kits to make up for lack of restaurant sales. So you can go check that website out. Uh, Do tune in to Supreme Master Television. Uh, (laughs) Tell us what what is at your local Loving Hut. Uh, Tell us what you think about these organizations. Do you have personal experience with any? Um, Are there some that you think more people should know about? maybe in your neck of the global woods. We can't wait to hear from you. We look forward to it. uh, And uh, we try to be easy to find on the internet. We do indeed. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff on uh, X, FKA Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and TikTok. 
A call 1-833-STDWYTK to leave a voicemail that we'll hear. When you call in, you've got three minutes. Give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your voice and message on the air. If you've got more to say that can fit in that message, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.